glass clinking thing. Oh, thank you. Look at this. Newly married guy, so he's got the ring. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, well, thank, thank, thank you, everybody, for coming uh, to the 12th annual, I don't know about annual, we skipped one year, but the 12th Endowed Garrick Lectureship, and we have a fabulous uh, visiting lecturer in uh, Dr. Riley Williams, who will introduce a little bit more formally um, once we kind of get into the program, but we need to stop and take one kind of a short detour, related but detour, and I'm going to actually ask Dr. Hanel, uh, one of our uh, uh, professors in orthopedics and residency director, to kind of come up here and, and do a little bit of a, an intro here. Well, thank you. Um, I'm Doug Hanel. Uh, I'm at the University of Washington. I do hand and microsurgery, a few elbows. And one of the tasks, or one of the things that, that happens at the University of Washington is that, that when uh, people of, of significance uh, reach a 25-year mark, uh, they are recognized by the university. And uh, so if you look around this room, there's one common thread. There's only one person that's a common thread to this room. Okay. Think about it. Who would that be? And that would be uh, Howard Chansky. <laughs> okay. I mean, you guys, you guys were all going through, you know, what great athlete did I take care of? Yeah. What resident did I take care of? <laughs> and yes, that is, that, that's Howard Chansky. And this is 25 years. And, you know, so the, here's the timeline within the university. You know, and if you break this time up from, from acting instructor um, and uh, acting uh, clinician, you know, four years later, he becomes an assistant. Four years later, he becomes an associate professor. Four years later, he becomes, four or five years later, he becomes a vice chair. Four or five years later, every five years, something significant, uh, of significance happens to, to Dr. Chansky. And so he is, uh, he is now our chair. But as you go through his curriculum vitae, which is a, a stout curriculum vitae, I think the one thing that is really true for all of us, and, and certainly as a residency director, the one thing that is truly outstanding in his curriculum vitae is the following. Is that, yeah, 96, 2002, 2004, 2013, being recognized for his efforts to have us train. And I think that it's, it's outstanding that we have this lectureship. At the same time that we have sequestered our residents, threes and fours, into uh, into a lab and have spent a week just doing arthroscopy, okay? And so uh, with that, um, Howard, I have a uh, certificate from the dean, and uh, congratulations. Truly a total surprise. When Albert, when Albert told me to sit down, he said, I'm going up first. I said, well, you can do that, but you're going to be fired after that. <laughs> but now I get it. Uh, well, thank you. That was very, uh, very nice. I appreciate it. You think I can do this uh, myself, maybe? <laughs> Stay there. Stay there. Don't move. Do my job. Uh, do I want to play from start? Okay. It's only going to go when I advance it, right? Well, uh, thanks again, uh, Dr. Hanel and uh, Dr. G. I didn't know anybody would remember that I was actually here for 25 years this year, and uh, I still need a pin. So <laughs> Pam, I'm sure Pamela can uh, get on that. So uh, welcome to the Garrick Lectureship. Uh, this is a, a really nice tradition uh, that we have in the uh, department uh, that I am so fortunate uh, to be leading right now. And I think we've been doing the Garrick Lecture for about 13 years. And uh, if you go up into that other room there, uh, you can see a long list of uh, really amazingly illustrious orthopedic surgeons. Uh, from around the country uh, and the world, actually, that have been uh, uh, Garrick lecturers. 
Uh, tonight we have another in that long line of illustrious uh, lecturers, but I'm going to let uh, Albert uh, introduce our uh, guest speaker in a few minutes because while we are all really excited to have Dr. Williams here, uh, he trained Dr. G, and Albert has uh, talked about him relentlessly, and I have to say I can only describe him as being giddy uh, over the last few days since uh, Riley and Tanya got here. Uh, so, But I'm going to talk a few minutes about the history of uh, sports medicine in our department, and, and uh, it really centers around uh, somebody who is here, uh, Colleen Johnson. Uh, and uh, a few other people who uh, have either passed their way or, or were not able to make it. And in 1967, uh, it was uh, the first time that we were covering the Husky football team. And that was really the idea of Dr. Claussen, uh, who got together with Dr. Hogness uh, and proposed that our department actually take care of the, the Huskies team. At the time, it was uh, the legendary coach, uh, Jim Owens. And Dr. Claussen had to actually travel around the country because sports surgery was so immature at that point and so undeveloped that he just needed to see uh, how it was actually working in a few other places. Uh, and in fact, uh, in talking to Colleen tonight, she had told me that we, I thought we had the first sports medicine uh, group in the country. We ha actually had the second. Uh, Joe Torg at Penn, or at Temple, I'm not sure where he was then, uh, actually beat us uh, uh, by, by no more than a year or so. And Dr. Claussen decided that he would have to recruit somebody to uh, run that group. And so the first head of our sports program was Dr. Jim Garrick, uh, who we recruited from the Mayo Clinic. It's just a great, uh, great picture. <laughs> And Ralph Requa was a PhD who worked with Dr. Garrick, uh, who uh, uh, also moved to uh, Seattle uh, with Jim Garrick. And so Jim was appointed the first chief of the sports medicine uh, division. And uh, looking very dapper is Colleen Johnson, who's here tonight. And, and Colleen, can, can you stand? This is one of my, one of my favorite people. She's, you know, just just a great supporter of the department uh, to this day. Uh, fortunately, we get to see her uh, frequently, not just at the Garrick lectureship. And uh, I hope everybody has a chance to say hi to her uh, sometime during the evening. So Colleen uh, is uh, is an RN, and she was the nurse manager of the clinic, and really was instrumental in, according to everybody who was involved in the sports medicine clinic in forming that clinic. Uh, it was uh, first Clinic 16, which I think was somewhere in the bowels of uh, the UW Medical Center. And then they moved to the Heck Edmondson Pavilion. Uh, and some of the first uh, that we had on-site radiology. Uh, it was uh, something that was uh, run by in a partnership between the uh, ICA and, and our department. Uh, and in addition to football, we were actually taking care of all of the athletes, uh, not just the football team. Uh, and women and men, uh, which amazingly enough from this vantage point was actually uh, uh, you know, a, new, a new concept. Uh, so the women were not, uh, you know, relegated to the background as far as uh, this program went. And I've had people who were involved at the time, you know, describe the program and Colleen uh, and Dr. Garrick as visionary. So a lot of interesting research uh, came out of the department and came out of that program. And, and when I started to do a uh, literature search and Google search when I put this talk together a few years ago. I was, I was sort of dumbfounded uh, that so many uh, first really came out of that partnership in that clinic. And uh, they were the first to look at AstroTurf. They were the first to look at the effect, effect of weather on AstroTurf and uh, the resulting uh, injuries. Uh, looked at, at braces, uh, studied uh, ACL injuries. 
ski bindings, and then I was talking to Dr. Wagner tonight, uh, and, and Ted told me that he was aware that what was considered the first sports medicine study in the United States actually came out in, I think, uh, 1972. Uh, and it was in, was it in Ski Magazine? Everybody is familiar with that journal. Uh, and it, it looked at uh, basically the demographics of injuries while skiing. And uh, I don't know, you know, obviously what the conclusions were, but Ted said they looked at the time of day, you know, how many runs you had done, uh, what your expertise level was, uh, what kind of slopes you were skiing on. Uh, and I think the conclusion was basically it was tied to fatigue uh, and, and intermediate and uh, begin, beginning skiers and injuries typically happened at the end of the day and at the somewhat counterintuitively at the bottom of the slope. Uh, so they were heavily into the epidemiology of sports injuries and again published uh, multiple articles on this. Uh, were I think probably the first to talk about uh, sports injuries and, and uh, in particular, uh, uh, how they differed in women uh, from in men. Uh, and they also were performing pre-participation uh, physicals. And so, uh, in 1975 uh, uh, was, not, I don't know if it was the advent of arthroscopy, it had been done in Japan, but it became uh, popular in the United States. And it really changed everything. And so uh, doctors Lassen and Tights uh, were recruited to the department. And, and we're fortunate to have Roger Lassen uh, here with us tonight. Another one of my favorite people in the department. And I'll just take one second. Uh, Roger has heard me say this before. So when I got here 25 years ago, the one person I remember uh, who really stood out for just always making sure that, you know, he was asking me how I was doing, uh, is there anything I can do for you, uh, and just, just really sort of exuded uh, kindness uh, was Roger, and so I have always remembered that. Uh, and again, it's great that uh, he continues to be involved in the department. Uh, and uh, in his own right, everybody knows Dr. Lassen became a, a renowned uh, surgeon. Uh, particularly with regard to injuries of the patella tendon uh, and the anterior cruciate ligament in adults and kids, uh, and was one of the first to really uh, talk about and define uh, the importance of isometry uh, in, in ACL injuries. So in 2013, that was the jumping ahead quite a few years. That was, uh, I think everybody knows, the next big uh, change for us and we were fortunate uh, to move in to this beautiful clinic in Husky Stadium. Uh, and uh, that got us out of uh, uh, heck ed, or got us out of the sports clinic that was, uh, I guess it was, uh, it was, Colleen, it wasn't the heck ed building, right, that we were still in at that time, before we moved into the stadium clinic. It was the last airlines arena. That's right, yeah, that's right, okay. Uh, and uh, this is a multidisciplinary clinic, which I think you can argue is uh, a sort of a modern iteration uh, of what our sports uh, program had, did, had, had been. And it's a collaboration between family medicine, uh, rehabilitation medicine, and orthopedic uh, surgery. Uh, we have our athletic trainers and therapists on site with us. It's, it's just a, a great model, uh, an impressive uh, physical structure. And we are speaking for, I think, the residents, the patients, uh, and, and the practitioners. We are all really grateful to, to be in that, in that building. Uh, so there is a performance training center there. There's physical therapy. Uh, there's athletic trainers, it's right under the stadium, and there is uh, relatively easy access uh, from the training rooms and the stadium to the, to the clinic. <clears throat> and so uh, that's Dr. Garrick on the left, uh, Dr. Tights. Uh, that's Ned Amendola, although I could swear it could be Ted Sousa's father if you know Ted. <laughs> Uh, Colleen, uh, Roger uh, next to the right, and then Ann and uh, Rick Matson, 
And of course, uh, Dr. Matson has also been instrumental in the history of the last uh, 30 years of our sports program. Uh, so thank you. And before I wind up, there's a couple of people I want to thank in addition to Colleen. Uh, and that's Ted Wagner, uh, who sponsored us tonight. If I'm uh, gone, if I go back 25 years, I don't know, Ted, how many years do you go back? We need to we need to get you a we need to get you a pin. Uh, yeah, biggest pin we can find. Uh, and then we had our arthroscopy boot camp this week, which is a great event that we put on for the residents. Uh, the uh, it's it's run by Dr. Warm and and uh, his assistants there are Chris Kwan and Mia Hagen and Albert G. Uh, the residents love it. And we could not do that without the support of Bobby Adams and Summit Surgery and, and uh, Arthrex. Uh, so thank you to them. Uh, I have to brag for a second. I know we don't have anything on the Hospital for Special Surgery, but when Dr. Williams saw that uh, program, uh, he told Albert and I last night at dinner that he had not seen anything like that in his travels around the country. Uh, so uh, thank you to to Bobby Adams and Athrex and Winston. Uh, Michael Saper, I think I saw you. You're gonna assist next year. You didn't answer my email, but you're on the hook now. <laughs> oh, all right. Oh, you were there, oh, nice. Okay, great, great. All right, so you were too busy to respond to my email. Yeah. And I uh, also wanna thank Paul Weesey. Uh, where, where is, uh, where is Paul? So Pacific Medical is one of the founding donors uh, for this program, and it would not be possible that we'd still be having this 13, 14 years later uh, without PacMed and without the support of Paul. And uh, it's very nice. He joins us here, I think, just about every year, if not every year. So we're very appreciative. Uh, take out my notes and make sure I haven't forgot anybody. That's it. So thank you. Enjoy your night. <laughs>said earlier, uh, we were all really excited when Albert told us that Dr. Williams was going to join us for the Garrick lecture this year, uh, but I can, uh, as I told you, nobody was more excited than Albert. Uh, it's somebody that I had heard him talk about, uh, and I'll say it again, uh, he just has been, uh, you know, even for Albert, happier and a little more animated than usual uh, since uh, Tanya and Riley got here Tuesday uh, afternoon, so... Uh, with that, I'm going to have Albert introduce you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Howard. So um, before I introduce our guest speaker tonight, um, I need to thank uh, a couple folks. Um, Holly, where are you? Is Holly here? Yeah, Holly, stand up. And Teresa? So Holly and Teresa uh, basically ran the deal. They put together the Garrett Lecture. So um, uh, Teresa was my admin and program manager um, for the last couple years, and then I was bragging about how good she was for so many years to Howard, and then he became chair, and he was like, all right, guess what's going to happen? <laughs> he, he scooped her away. So, But then I was all sad about it, and then Holly came, and I was very, very relieved. So, And she's excellent. And she's done a fabulous job. This is her first year running the Garrick thing, and it's no small matter to put all this whole thing together. And uh, so awesome work. And Teresa was great in kind of advising her since this was kind of her first year. So I got a, a couple gifts for, for you both. And then for uh, Dr. Williams' wife, Tanya, who's also a physician. She's a, a pediatrician uh, by training. Um, for coming and hanging out with us, we have a little gift for you too. So thank you. <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, so it, it is. Uh, so first of all, well, thank you everybody for coming. I think this is one of the biggest and kind of most uh, well attended uh, Garricks that we've had since I've been here. And, and I, like I was telling the other day, I've been here for five years. So it's really been a privilege to be a part of it. And um, and so um, I'm I'm really happy that we got Dr. Williams to come uh, be our Garrick lecturer this year. Um, Dr. Williams is uh, coming to us from the Hospital for Special Surgery. I think uh, most of you may know that. This is where I train. He was a mentor of mine. He's the director of the Institute for Cartilage Repair there. Uh, and that kind of cartilage repair has been his uh, area of clinical focus as well as uh, research. And he's an internationally renowned authority on that topic. And he gave us a nice grand rounds the other day. Um, uh, on that topic specifically, and then we traveled to our boot camp, and, and he gave us a nice demonstration uh, for the residents and kind of taught them about all the intricacies of cartilage repair. I don't know about all of them, but he gave us a good foundation, that was awesome. So um, just to give you a little background, uh, Dr. Williams is the uh, medical director for the Brooklyn Nets. Um, and uh, in, in sports medicine, I mean, if you take care of a, a team, you take care of all the the um, you know the the details of a, of a professional team with all the millions of dollars that are going on that's kind of you know it's one of the pinnacles of our kind of work I think it it shows that people trust you as an expert in your field so he not only takes care of the Brooklyn Nets um, oh and um, they used to formerly be known as the New Jersey Nets uh, when I was with Dr Williams six years ago uh, I had the distinct privilege of being his assistant. Uh, on the medical staff of the New Jersey Nets. Um, and uh, if I remember correctly, first of all, we almost didn't have a season, right? That was a year that we had that strike and it was kind of in, the, in like limbo whether we were actually gonna have an NBA season. Then lo and behold, we did, although we had a shortened season as a result. And if I'm not mistaken, the Nets were kind of like the bottom basement team that year. <laughs> But we had we had a couple good wins and it was it was a good time and then spending time with Dr. Williams, obviously is 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 an incredible privilege and I learned a ton from him about how to take care of elite athletes, and this little picture of me and, and Dr. Williams and this is uh, Dr. Farber who was our uh, medical guy. So um, he's not only the medical director for the Nets, he's also medical director for the uh, uh, Major League Soccer team, the New York Red Bull. Uh, and also the Iona uh, College Gales, which was always fun. A um, couple funny stories about traveling up to New Rochelle, New York, from the island of Manhattan. I had to go upstate a couple times, and I even got a couple parking tickets. They had these like video, like parking tickets, and I swear, like I got more than I ever like. Some somebody, you know, and, and uh, we had like three fellows that took care of the team, and for some reason, I was the only guy with the car. <laughs> and I swear, I don't, I don't think I racked up all the tickets myself. But you know, you get, you, it just goes by the license plate. So I had to pay all those <laughs> tickets. So that's, that was awesome. Um, he, um, he is a team physician for USA Basketball, and this is him with Paul George. We know that uh, uh, Paul George had a, a bad injury to his leg, and Dr. Williams was instrumental in helping him get back to form. And you can see him there, kind of hanging out in this uh, picture. A little bit more about his background, Dr. Uh, Williams was a football player at Yale um, where he did his undergraduate studies and he was committed to be a, um, a uh, doctor of some sort so then he went on to Stanford where he did his medical training and then did his residency as well as his sports medicine and shoulder fellowship at the hospital for surgery or hospital for special surgery and he stayed on ever since. Um, <laughs> We all know Manhattan is a special place. Uh, this is the Gotham Magazine, which I think is like one of their like high society magazines. And this was their like fashion issue. This is Carmelo looking pretty dapper on the front cover. And then they had their feature on like best dressed, best looking sports medicine surgeons. And you know, <laughs> Dr. Williams. Look, looking, you know, I mean, I, he's looking good. And, uh, <laughs> two other of my, uh, of our mentors at special surgery, Dr. Alchek and Dr. Answorth, and uh, Dr. Allen, uh, Answorth Allen. And what's really impressive about this, so Dr. Williams, obviously, he's, he's been at special surgery for 20 years now, which is going to give us kind of his 20 years perspective on trying to get these elite athletes back to sport after injury. 
and I'm really looking forward to that talk. But he's been there for 20 years, built up a big practice. He's a world famous guy. Everybody seeks him out. Most importantly, I think he was on Housewives of New York or New Jersey. Like one of my very good friends from medical school who was some, for some reason into all of the Housewives series texted me a picture the other day of like of Dr. Williams on one of the episodes and she was like, oh my god, this is, you know, this is, I know this guy, you train with him. Anyway, he's built up this big practice in New York City, which is, is a crazy place in my, from my understanding and being a fellow there, to build up a big practice and, and be the guy. And not only that, he has this kind of entrepreneurial spirit, so the three of these uh, fine gentlemen here have kind of gone on and, and started their own kind of clinic with hospital special surgery backing, and it's like a big endeavor, and he's really excited about it. So I'm really impressed with that. He's kind of reached that big baller status, you know, like in the orthopedic world, and I think that's really cool. So just wanted to mention that. And then a random picture. Uh, one, I put this in there so that it would remind me to talk about the first clinic that I was in with uh, Dr. Williams and you, you, you start your fellowship and you don't really know people and you kind of worry you don't want to make people think you don't know what you're doing so you're kind of anxious and uh, we had a, the morning clinic and then Dr. Williams was like uh, go get something to eat it's lunchtime and uh, I went and got like a sandwich there's a little cafeteria underneath this clinic and uh, some chips I think probably and uh, come back and he's having like nuts, <laughs> like walnuts, and uh, they're not even toasted. <laughs> There's no salt. I said, I said, what are you eating, Dr. Williams? He's like, I got my mixed nuts. <laughs> so you want some? And I said, okay. And I tried some, and like I said, they weren't roasted. They're not salted. <laughs> it was terrible. And um, <laughs> I said, Dr. Williams, like th these aren't even roasted or salted. And he said. He said, are you crazy? I got so much hypertension in my family history. I can't be eating salt. <laughs> you know, I got like other medical problems. I got to be real. <laughs> and, um, and he was just eating these nuts. It was terrible. <laughs> I think, uh, honestly, if I remember correctly, maybe I'm making this up now, but I probably offered him some of my chips, <laughs> potato chips. And he probably ate like one. He's like, all right, I might have one. But we all know from eating p potato chips, like who can eat literally just one, right? Incredible discipline. That's that's Dr. Williams. He's like, hey, listen, I got all these things in my family history, so I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna eat my nuts, and then I'm gonna work out. He's like a workout fiend. He's a gym rat. He's in the in the gym five, six, seven days a week. You see him here, him getting shredded, and then again, entrepreneurial spirit. He's got this uh, device. I think it's called like the Thermo One. Is that what it is? This is a very uh, uh, cool thing, it seems like, according to his website, where it's, a, it's, a, it's like a recovery device. You can, you can freeze it, and so this roller gets really cold, and it helps muscle recovery, or you can heat it up, and then you got, but you don't make a mess. There's no like, ice melting everywhere, so it's like a really cool thing. And then here he is. He's an avid cyclist, too. This is like the, UDA, or excuse me, the HSS cycling team, and Dr. Williams is at the front, so. He's, uh, and I think that was kind of like where I realized, okay, this is how he got to where he got to. Incredible discipline, uh, dedication, uh, always very energetic, you know, something that we can all aspire to. Uh, and that's how he kind of got to be this, you know, famous guy that we, that I looked up to the whole time I was there. I, I still consider him an incredible mentor and somebody to try to model myself after. And, and kind of most importantly, he's here with his beautiful wife, uh, Tanya, and w we spent a lot of time together uh, kind of schlepping back and forth between Manhattan to get to Newark for the Nets. And uh, he'd always talk about his kids. He's got two beautiful kids. Uh, one's in college, one's soon to be in college. He's always, you know, beaming when he talks about them. So he's, he's succeeded kind of in the game of life. And so I think he's 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 incredible uh, mentor, incredible colleague, somebody I consider a friend now. And it's really a pleasure to welcome him here, to have him here in in, in our town, to to kind of grace us with his presence. And so please, everybody, help uh, in welcoming Dr. Riley Williams as our 12th James Garrett lecturer. still never get comfortable listening to people talk about you. <laughs> um, uh, so I want to thank you guys for having me. Uh, 
these grand rounds come in a couple of varieties. I said this yesterday, the kind of stop and drop where you fly across the country, give an hour lecture and, and leave. And, and I have to say, I've, I've gotten to a few of these, and this is uh, always an honor to be part of a, of a name lectureship. I take it very seriously. I just want to thank Albert Howard and the rest of the department, Roger, for, for having me. So, so this talk today is, I was looking at it today, it's a little rambling, a little random, uh, but, but if you'll indulge me, I'll, I'll take you guys on a little bit of a trip with me. So, uh, so take it back to 1996, going for my first job interview. I cannot stand New York City. I want to go out west. And so uh, word on the street is that there, there's been an open sports job at the University of California, uh, San Francisco. So I get in there, and David Bradford, the chairman, spine surgeon, sits me down, and literally, and I'm not embellishing this, this is what he says. So, before we get going, I want to make one thing clear. Son, I liken team coverage to running a well baby clinic. It's a full-on waste of time, and I will not support this type of endeavor in my, in my department. So, this is a this is a two day interview. <laughs> I've got eight more people to meet. A trip out to UC Berkeley, and and I and I immediately am like I'm 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 shook. I'm I'm braced. I don't I, I'm like it's, this is my first. This is what I'm this is what I'm facing, and and just to stop there for a second because I, I tend to do these talks mainly focused towards the, the residents who are, and trainees who are in the audience. You know. You talk about sports medicine, and Howard alluded to it in his talk. It's new, it, and, and it's, and it's uh, quite frankly, when I started, kind of thought to be a little frivolous and not meaningful. So, so that was the environment, even in the mid-'90s, when we were supposed to be kind of enlightened about this thing that we do, team coverage in sports. It really bothered me a little bit because I felt like, you know, why, why was this important to me? It made me really question that whole weekend. Uh, what does a team physician actually do? Uh, how does it fit into my long-term career plan? Uh, how could I, if I had the opportunity, make that experience more academically purposeful or meaningful to my colleagues? And then finally, at the end of the day, was, this, was I even being reasonable in wanting to do this type of work or pursue this type of, uh, of endeavor? So, so Albert listed it all through, and, and as you can see, I, I'm typically smiling. Maybe the one on the top left, I, I can't remember what was going on there. Maybe someone with a concussion, I didn't quite know what to do. But anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. I, I feel these lectures, you've you got to get a little bit of a flavor, a little bit of where, where I'm from and, and, and why I am the way I am. So I grew up in South Central LA, literally right around where that arrow is. And while it wasn't terrible, it really wasn't good. Uh, so this is kind of what's going on. You had Boys in the Hood, the Watts Towers, had some rioting going on. Rodney King was getting beat up, and there was just a lot of a lot of random events happening in and around. So uh, a lot of love in my house, not a lot of money, uh, no culture of success clearly in my neighborhood. Uh, and and what I would say, I was subjected to what I. It just it wasn't bad every day, but it was just random. You know, someone's house is burning down. There were some cops running through your backyard. Oh. Some dude got shot at the liquor store. I mean, you, you, you tend to compartmentalize and, and, and continue, right? So that's what I did. I mean, I was pretty happy. A brother, he, my brother's a doctor, you know. Uh, uh, but it, it really was like I had to figure out how am I going to compartmentalize and, and divert myself. So I got into sports relatively early, baseball, basketball, football, and stuff. And, and one of the byproducts of that involvement as a, I'm going to say, middle school or grammar school kid was that like your, 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 your team from inner city LA got to go out to Palos Verdes, and you got to go to Newport Beach, or you got to go to Palisades. So for someone whose world really centered around a two square mile area, going to these places seemed very foreign, but, but like, like, ooh, okay. So, oh, this is what it's like, like to feel it and touch it. And then when you were just as good as those kids from those places, it was even more empowering. So it was really, for me, sports was, was really, really quite significant part of my personal development. So I was into the Lakers, I was into the Dodgers, into the Rams. The Rams were probably my favorite team. And I was so, so into sports and I, I listened to the Ram game on the radio. That was back when if you didn't sell, sell out the game and the home team, 72 hours before a game, it was, wouldn't be on TV, it was a blackout. 
So, and you never, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the LA Coliseum, I think it seats 90,000. I mean, they never sold out, they were never that good, even when they were good. So, uh, the teams were relatively successful, and so I envisioned myself as an athlete. The only problem was, uh, you know, I really wasn't that athletic. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, this is Doughboy, that's pretty much me. You know, uh, chubby and slow, not really coordinated. Uh, I was always the last kid picked for sports. So, so for, you know, and, and, and forgive me a little leeway here, for someone who considers himself as a smart kid, it was embarrassing and humiliating to be picked last. Just drove me crazy. So, so fortunately, you know, as I, as I hit puberty, I got, I got a little higher, got a little taller, lost a little weight, it was good. Uh, I, was, I, I was always like, you know, I was incredibly average, you know, decent at everything, but not particularly great. And uh, however, you know, the academics were a different story, and that's really where my, my, my largesse developed. So uh, I, I developed into a decent high school football player, but I had a similar event in my second year playing uh, to low fracture, which, uh, which I fractured on a Thursday, went to Kaiser, saw a PA, he did not reduce me, spent the weekend in a long leg cast with Tylenol, saw the orthopedist Monday, and uh, he cut the bottom of the cast off and, and said, all right, son, we can do this the easy way or the hard way. Which, you were gonna, which one are you going to do? He said, the quick way or the slow way? I'm like, so, I'm like, well, let's do the quick way. He said, are you sure? <laughs> I was going to give you some Versed. I'm like, Versed? I don't know what that is, but it sounds good. So I took the Versed, and, and I woke up, and my, and my knee, I mean, my ankle was back in place. But he, he had such a... Uh, a way about it. it was, he was engaging and funny. Not, not at all like I had ever envisioned doctors, right? Not serious. He wasn't talking down to me. It was kind of jokey. And I was like, oh, this is not kind of different kind of doctor. I could kind of see that, that kind of doctor. And went on to, to college football. But in the back of my mind, I, I knew this wasn't, this wasn't for me. That, that fracture I experienced really kind of sat me. And so it was a bit of a reality check. So you guys got this guy, average athletic ability. I love sports. I had no career path at this point, like zero. And the simple fact was I had to get out of there. So, you know, what was I going to do? And that was, that was really like the, the overriding arch for me. So in the 70s and 80s, it's been, been mentioned here, it was really like the nascent time of sports medicine, all these guys here uh, uh, who, who all have a common thread. I'll let you guys look at the pictures and figure it out. Um, uh, certainly not relatable to me. Uh, uh, however, there was a guy in the ether back in the early 70s who was a little unique. This is Clarence Shields. Uh, Clarence is one of the founding members of the Curl and Job Clinic. And, and in the early 70s was the head team doctor for the Los Angeles Rams. And his sons went to my high school. Uh, but up to that point, I had no idea that doctors actually even helped teens. I didn't even know there was a doctor on the sideline. So it was really quite new. So I never met him, and actually never met him, but I knew he was there. He looked like me. He was involved in sports on some sort of intellectual level. Uh, I knew I wasn't stronger or faster and probably couldn't play, but I, I knew I probably could be smarter. And now I had a clear-cut career goal, and honestly, uh, and, and uh, Albert alluded to it, I'm pretty, pretty pragmatic and goal-oriented. So I uh, really kind of framed my work. I was undeterred, went to Yale, which was awful. Uh, <laughs> Uh, for, listen, I'm happy I went. People know me. I'm happy I went, but it was pretty awful for lots of reasons. We don't get into. Uh, but after that awful experience, everything subsequently was easy. Med school, piece of cake. No problem. Stanford was great. I got my first exposure to high profile kind of sports trained doctors. This is Michael Dillingham. And I, I didn't leave the quote out, but when he said to Sports Illustrated, it really resonated for me. He's like, I knew I was never going to play in the Super Bowl, but having him have back surgery with me and return within six months and win the Super Bowl was, 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 was his greatest achievement. And, and I was like, wow, that's, that's, that's pretty profound. I can relate to that, and that's what I wanted to do. So I did my residency at HSS, firmly focused on a med, uh, sports medicine career. Uh, and I had done college research at Stanford, so it was sort of a nice extension. I was hired at HSS basically uh, to, to kind of continue that. Uh, but as a residence, we did resident sports coverage, which was great in the New York area. Uh, and uh, while I was a resident, focus again on college injuries, ACL, and shoulder instability. So, instantly exciting time. I used to hang out in the, in the uh, soft tissue lab with the fellows. You had PhDs. Dr. Warren is one of my primary mentors. Really just exciting, kind of bubbly time. Things are happening, and 
it was like everything was new, right? Uh, oh, you could ask a question, you know, what, what happens to the posterior capsule when you dislocate a shoulder? I don't know, let's go get some shoulders and we'll dislocate them and see. I mean, it was pretty, pretty straightforward. So, so uh, uh, it was really fun to be around there. Uh, so I did the one-year fellowship there, and I spent primarily, uh, I was lucky, I got to do both the uh, uh, New York Football Giants with Dr. Warren and the Mets with Dr. Alchek, and I really just got a deep exposure. So joined the service in 1997, uh, hoping to be part of a pro team. Uh, I started out with the Mets as the assistant team physician. I was covering about 35 to 40 games a year, and uh, reality set in really quick. No surgeries, right? Little real responsibility outside of just sitting at the game. Uh, but I did learn the ropes and I was observant. Uh, I was a bit fr frustrated, but chomping at the beat. So, but it taught me a lesson like don't expect too much too quickly. You have to ingratiate yourself into the culture of the team and really uh, uh, with the, with the uh, uh, trainers. Uh, I got Iona uh, a couple of years after being in practice and the college experience was different. Lots of pathology, both operative, non-operative, medical, non-orthopedic, rheumatologic, mental, sexual, <laughs> developmental. Uh, uh, and I'd say the first clinic we did, I think 12 athletes came, and within a month there would be 80 kids waited outside the training room at Iona College. Just, I mean, so you start at 6, you finish at 10.30, and, and you, you don't charge anybody a dime, and you, you learn, and you bond, and you, and you treat. And that was probably, quite frankly, where I got my most training as a sports surgeon, really understanding, like, what is this, you know, like, return to play? Like, what, what does that mean? Who's involved? We got trainers, we got strength coaches, we got nutritionists, we got teachers, we got psychologists involved, which I never really had even thought about because I just wanted to do ACL surgery and 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 then uh, you know see them a couple of times and hear hear how great they were later. So. Uh, this was the bedrock of my sports practice, and it really helped me to learn when to operate and not to operate, and, and kind of, quite frankly, how to connect and, and talk to people in the office. It's high volume every week, week after week. So my apprenticeship with the Mets then led to my positions with the, with the Nets and Red Bulls. I've uh, been with the Nets and Red Bulls since 2005, and I go to pretty much all their home games. I didn't go tonight because I was here. Uh, uh, shockingly, we are 2-0 and in the preseason. And again, the Nets had the worst record in the league last year. They went 0-5 in the preseason last year, so 2-0 in the preseason, feeling pretty good. Uh, uh, I have to go to all their national travel. I go to all playoff games. I go to the Combine. I go to the NBA Draft. I go to the NBA Team Physicians Meeting at the All-Star Week and the President's Weekend. I go to Summer League now because my GM wants me to go to Summer League in Las Vegas. So, you know, uh, a lot of time. Uh, not a lot of surgery, uh, and a lot of issues in and around family, uh, but you know, non-orthopedic, non-musculoskeletal injury, is injury issues, really. Uh, the Red Bulls have a long season. They go from January to November. I go to approximately 30 home games. Again, all international travel and a preseason training camp. Uh, they have 200 plus athletes in their academy system for whom uh, I'm responsible. And, and really, again, you hear this theme here again, not a lot of surgery. You know, surgery, guys who have surgery with the Red Bulls typically get cut, so we're really trying not to do it unless it's something catastrophic like an ACL. Uh, been with USA Basketball since 2013. That's been kind of fun. Uh, we'll, more about that later. But I'm also a consultant surgeon for a number of leagues as well. And so in the course of the talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, what's the difference between a team versus a consultant. The, 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 the flow and the interactions are a little different. And, I'll just give you guys a little bit of food for thought, at least some of my observations. So uh, I alluded to this. So what are the quick realizations? Uh, way more non-operative and operative problems. Daily calls, daily, right, with your athletic trainers, coaches, and uh, management are expected. Uh, obviously takes a lot of time. There's a lot of downtime. And what was really bracing to me was that this downtime is not effective time. It's not like you can travel with a team and go hide in a corner and work on your computer, write a paper. They want you on the field, they want you watching, they, 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 they want to feel like you're part of the culture and you're embedded, that you're not this weird sort of uh, 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 separate entity that, that has a force field around it. That, that, that's really a big thing. So that was a little bit of a shock because I figured, well, you know, uh, for a Giants game, for example, if the game started at one, you had to be at the stadium at nine. Okay. Uh, I'm the fellow, I'm at Giant Stadium, it's 9 in the morning, and I'm just sitting around. You know, there's no food, 
Uh, and I don't know if those of you know Dr. Warren, he's great to me, but he's not exactly like, you know, the, the lexicon of conversation. Uh, so, so it was, it was, uh, it could be, you know, hurry up and wait. So, so a lot of downtime there. Um, your time isn't compensated on the whole, by and large. And uh, with all this time, I'm like, well, you know, what am I doing? I got to work, I got family, I got my, my personal needs meaning my wife's needs and in academics, uh, business and team. So it's easy to get lost in that. So I was always trying to balance that. So, so my, my statement to you tonight is, is the following as it relates to the first slide. My frontline exposure to these athletes has framed my practice philosophy. And instead of functional outcome scores and these validated outcomes measures that we talk about in papers, ultimately, regardless of your recreational, elite, pro, a successful return to play is a metric by which I'm judged, ultimately. Uh, and so it is the attention to details beyond the surgery for me that has kind of helped me understand what the components are that, that they really help you be successfully clinically in this area. So, uh, so what's my first point uh, to the trainees in the room? 24-7 uh, job, your heart has to be in it. Uh, you will not be compensated, but just adhere to your three keys of excellence, the affability, availability, and ability. Uh, always have a smile on, and you should be successful. Probably the key thing I learned as a fellow was that the relationship between the team doctor and the athletic and medical training staff is the key to successful uh, return to play. That's just the key to your just continued success and, and presence with the team. Uh, I was always struck by the relationship between Ronnie Barnes, who's the head uh, athletic trainer and vice president with the Giants, and, and Russ Warren. I uh, was one born of uh, trust and mutual respect, open communication, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's always striking to me. I've been at HSS on staff for 20 years. Uh, the number of fellows who, who were not particularly successful in their apprenticeship with the Giants are the ones that came in treating athletic trainers like they were their boss. And it's sort of shocking to think like you're a visitor and somehow they're beneath you. Uh, it doesn't happen a lot, but I've seen it happen even in the present day. So they, they know a lot and their skill set is different. It's, it's, it's compatible, it's not, it's not a race, it's not a contest. Uh, and I've always found when I have a new athletic trainer or a new situation, that is my focus and my key relationship to build from minute one. They are there on the front line every day, and I always say, hey, it's my job to back you up and to support you, but let's talk and keep the lines open so we're on the same page, and it seems to work very, very well. I alluded to this earlier, but again, I won't go through the whole list, but it's obviously a multidisciplinary team, and it's a multidisciplinary team of experts, and that's what I want you to remember. These are experts, experts in musculoskeletal, athletic training, physical therapy, the chiropractor, the nutrition, the psychiatrist, right? So you may be the head team physician, but I surround myself with excellence. I like to be challenged, I like to know. And at the end of the day, I know that I'm putting forth the best plan or the best uh, sequence of diagnostics for these players, even if it falls outside of my area of expertise, because I trust my team. So I use them, and I don't have a whole lot of ego about it. I just want them, to, all, I, all I want is for athletes to get better. Uh, a clear delineation of rules, or excuse me, roles is important. Uh, I always remember the frustration I had with the Mets not really being involved. Uh, I'd get out to the stadium and the head team physician would be there. He wouldn't have told me he was going. I'm like, you know, what's happening? And, you know, you, you just want to feel like you're part of it. So what I've tried to do in, in general is to create these teams with people who don't have overlapping fields of interest. So for example, with the Red Bulls, I have an internist. I've got a foot and ankle surgeon, orthopedist, who does all the foot and ankle stuff, and then obviously do the, sh the knee shoulder stuff. Uh, we have some of the younger guys come in, so the younger guys take care of New York Red Bull 2, but any surgeries that come out of New York Red Bull 2, we do together, but they get to do it. So, so it's, it's, it, you have to have a little bit of largesse about it and give away things. It's, it's hard to do sometimes, but you have to convince management and everybody that that's key. But it's nice because then everybody understands where they are and they tend to be happy and it creates more stability. Uh, player engagement, this seems obvious, right? Be direct and honest, take the time to educate players and their families. Be objective and act in the best interest of the player and try not to be an agent of the institutional club. It's a, it's a little bit of a balancing act. Uh, 
However, I think uh, in, in most cases, if you adhere to the far former point, you'll be in good shape. And uh, choose treatments that will facilitate the most direct path and, and return to sport. And what that means is, we'll get into, like, be thoughtful about it. Uh, sometimes the best path may not be the thing that you do the best. So maybe that requires somebody else. So maybe that requires a little bit of letting go of the ego. So you hear a lot about that. Because ultimately, I just want the player to be better. They'll remember you sending that patient out or sending them out to the person who was the expert as long as they get back and they'll trust you even more. And that's important. Understand your role. The team physician, obviously, this graphic exists within the structure. And you have touch points with everybody. So you have to make sure that the medical team is of one voice and communicating the same things. Because you may get pinged by someone randomly outside of uh, the lines of normal communication. So you don't want there to be any confusion. Uh, attend to things very quickly in urgency. This is something that sticks with me all the time. These teams, this is their day job. They take it very seriously. So you can't show up on the scene after a busy day in clinic with a hangdog face about how tired you are and everything else. Because they, 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 they know you're busy. They want upbeat, excited, paying attention to the game. I had a, an internist with me with the Nets who wouldn't go out to the game. He'd sit in the back and he was doing charts and, and, and was shocked when we moved from from uh, uh, New Jersey to Brooklyn that, 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 that uh, he wasn't coming with us. So, you know, I understand, maybe not the most interesting. Albert, we were 12 and 70 when you were there. <laughs> All right. So, so it's hard, but, but I always remember that this is their primary job and they want to feel the dedication and commitment to, to the enterprise from you as much as them. So. Keep that in mind. All athletes expect a successful return to play. So a couple of clinical things I've focused on which have sort of resonated with me over the years is uh, avoid protracted immobilization and non-weight bearing. If you really look objectively, how many rehab papers do we have in our literature? Not a lot. We don't have a lot of things talking about accelerated rehab for rotator cuff, for stability surgery, one week, two weeks, six weeks. Most of us just do what our mentors did, right? So Russ Warren would, would, would immobilize a, a stability surgery for six weeks. However, clinically early, I would notice that the people who didn't listen to you about immobilization were the ones that typically did the best. So why don't we skip the getting stiff part and just get to the moving part, right? And so you employ those things in your high demand athletes, they work out and they affect clinical practice in a positive way. So, so that's one thing that I've sort of learned. Another one is uh, uh, the effective rehab plan needs to be over overseen by someone other than yourself. You are not a physical therapist. You are not a strength coach. I would advise you guys in your clinical practice, when your patients ask you what exercises to do, you say, I am an anatomic reconstructionist. I'm not a strength coach. You need to go to someone who can give you that advice. I don't give papers. I don't give exercises. We are not trained to do that. And you should stay away from it. Final point here is that clearance does not equal a readiness to play. So I'll use words like, yeah, you need post rehab fitness training. You're an ACL patient. It's six months out. You've not pivoted. You cannot go play a 90 minute soccer game next weekend, even though they all think that because they focus in on that six months. Six months, six months, six months. So I'll say something that in the MLS, the mean return to play, I believe our internal studies is about 8.7 months. So what do you think happens in that two and a half, three months? <coughs> you start to pivot and you practice, you increase the load, you, 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 you achieve a restoration of some functional deficits that were there because of the injury and you get better. It's hard, a lot of tears with that. And I'll show you some things near the end of the talk to sort of address how we are dealing with it. But, but it's a good way to sort of get people ready for, for what's next after that initial thing. So what are the do's? You know, maintain player confidence, discuss treatment rationales, use consultants judiciously and stick to your area of expertise. And, and, and don't, be, don't be static. Like Russ, I believe, is 78 years old. He reads JBJS cover to cover. He reads all the articles, not just the abjects in American Journal of Sports Medicine, and, and he, I think he even reads orthopedics. I mean, he reads everything. So, so he's always looking for an edge, and I've always respected that in him, and I, I try my best to, 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 to mimic that. Show empathy and attention. 
and understand that all, not all your treatments are going to work, but the, the patients and the athletes will stick with you as long as they feel that level of investment from you. And that does require giving a little bit more of yourself. Maybe it requires you to give them your, your cell phone. Maybe it requires a little extra call just to encourage them. Maybe it's, it's uh, uh, just a little bit more of a personal test that you may, that you may not want to do or you'll tire, but trust me, it goes a long way. It's helped me. Uh, don'ts. Don't discuss player issues outside of the team framework. Watch your social media presence. I have that, so you have to be very uh, uh, aware of that. Don't veer from your traditional treatment methods. Use what you know and what you know how to do. And if you do bite off more than you can chew, it's probably not going to end well for you. Don't overpromise. Be honest and realistic. Don't be a cheerleader and try to remain objective. And here's what I mean. I've seen a lot of guys they, and girls, they, they get this player, they come in, especially from the consultant side, a little starry-eyed, and, and they want to operate on this athlete. So you start saying things. Well, you know, he said six, but I can get you back for it. I mean, it becomes like you're sitting here objectively. You say, yeah, well, of course that makes sense. But, but I'm just telling you, I've seen it over and over and over again. I'm much more stalwart and circumspect about what I say. And I'm like, listen, you, you, you can, I can tell you what, what I think or I can tell you what you want to hear. It, it'll serve you better o over the long term. And just try to minimize your ego uh, and realize that at the end of the day, uh, you want to just do the right thing. Um, so last piece of advice in terms of this whole team physician role is uh, stay vigilant, don't make any assumption, because it's always easy to think as you're sitting there at your 45th game that it's just another game. So, so this is a uh, USA Basketball Intra-Squad game 2014. This is uh, as they're going to go on their World Cup of Basketball. It's Paul George defending, goes down. Now, but I stop this. So I'll stop it there. All right. So I don't know if you guys can see, but that's me kind of sitting at the end of the bench right there. You can't make me out. I'm straight up looking at my phone. Uh, I've been there the whole week. Nothing had happened. There was no training room. The guys didn't want to talk to me. They're like, there's nothing wrong. It's, it's, it's a very light thing. They're all all-stars. They're all healthy. So I just wanted to get out of there. Seven days of nothing. At this end, I think there was about 12 minutes left in the game. And it's about 6.45. I got a 5.30 a.m. flight. I'm thinking, man, I'm going to have to get up at 4. Time I can hit this Uber. You know? <laughs> and, and so when Paul got hurt, I wasn't even looking. Straight up, I wasn't looking. So, so I look up. I'm like, what, what, something happened. You heard like a fun, fucking something. I, was, I thought maybe he hit his head. So. In retrospect, uh, it really was a trap game. But the game was being played at the Thomas and Mack Center, which is a smaller court. The stanchion for the baskets were about three feet closer to the court than normal. So when he came down on that defensive play, trying to block hard and shot, I mean, the stanchion was there. And he probably had, just based on the pathology, some stress issues going on in that area because it broke pretty easily. But what's the point? Uh, EMTs were not where they were supposed to be. They didn't have a splint. There wasn't a contracted ambulance to take us where we need to go. There was no trauma surgeon on call specifically for this group to help with any issues. So, so it was really, it was, it was quite awful. I mean, I don't talk about it a whole lot. I talk about it in clothes because nobody really wants to talk about it. But this forever just changed my whole like seriousness about team coverage, right? Now listen, it tur turned out well. I, I, I scooped him up. Beta dine and towel over that open fracture. I made a splint out of some boxes. I started yelling at the EMTs. I, you know, basically commandeered an ambulance and got him fixed. So, if if the open fracture happened at 6:50, it was rotted and, and closed up by 9:50. It was crazy, but but uh, uh, it was it basically just to me. If you kind of consider the circumstances, it's it's really easy with these team coverage things to get. Take them for granted, because really, 99% of the time, nothing really happens. So I try to keep this thing in mind as I'm as I'm uh, 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 going to my game from uh, for the 45th time of the year. So uh, just a couple of thoughts about the whole consultant surgeon thing, because I do have a bit of a tertiary practice. So they exist outside of the normal structure, and, and this is usually to me the tension point, right? How do you how do you uh, uh, deal with maybe a team physician who's taking care of an athlete and now this athlete has decided, yeah, yeah, you're nice and everything, but I'm going to go over and see Dr. Williams. 
So you have to be uh, very respectful and communicative. And so for me, I try to really hard to, to understand what are the, what's the dynamic of the team I'm dealing with, who sent the player, uh, really where, where is the player contractually, like what are they thinking about, and, and, and really try to ingratiate myself and assert myself you know, uh, collaboratively and communicatively uh, with the team. So uh, I try to delineate the clinical problem accurately, obviously, and then talk to the player about expectation and goals. Immediately talk to the team about their expectation and goals and how I can best help them achieve that. And then perhaps the most, most uh, uh, significant thing is I try to base all the treatments on uh, referenceable uh, evidence-based medicine because then everyone can kind of get, it get, becomes less about my experience and more about what the literature says, right? So in terms of delaying the clinical problem accurately, obviously injury history, mechanism, I rely a lot on imaging. And one of the things I'm doing of late in terms of this return to play is a better assessment of preoperative uh, fitness and conditioning. So for example, for all my college patients who come in, we do what's called a quality of movement assessment done in conjunction with our physical therapy and athletic training staff, force place, motion analysis, high-speed video, because I get a better sense of hmm, who am I dealing with, how long have they been injured, and what am I going to have to correct once that hole in the cartilage is, is, is filled and they don't have knee pain anymore. And it gives everybody a better sense in terms of the team. We share this information with the other teams right away. And it's very constructive because again, I'm just trying to objectify the parameters, right? I can fill the hole in the cartilage. I have no idea how long it's gonna take for your glute strength to return to the point where you can twist and kick a soccer ball or, or run a pass route, right? So, so I, I put up this slide here. So we talked about uh, understanding uh, return to play rates and, and they're available. So uh, you want to educate the, the player, agent, and family in surgical indication process. Consider all the above in the final decision on surgery and manage expectations. So you can see these numbers here with, regard, with regards to return to play. I mean, all of them, even though we tell typical ACL patients that it's, it's six months you know, uh, till you're cleared, I say it's six months till you're medically cleared to train, and there'll be some latent period somewhere between three and six months before you get back to sports safely because, as we know, most of the uh, recurrences after ACL surgery, either ipsilateral leg or contralateral leg, happen in the first three months after clearance. So I'm less of a cheerleader that way, and I speak much more clearly and definitively to all my patients with regard to this issue. Uh, managing the team can probably be the most difficult one. They look at you as a usurper. You're, 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 you don't understand. You just, you just want to operate as a player. And, and, and so you have to be very uh, uh, politically astute, quite frankly, uh, in terms of engaging the team and, and effectively managing these patients through the rehab. This evidence-based medicine thing is, is a big deal to me uh, because we have, the, we have evidence now. So for example, uh, you can see very clearly in a couple of uh, uh, meta-analysis done, one uh, with myself and Aaron Christian, another group uh, in the Journal of Arthroscopy, looking at these, these four commonly employed methodology of, of uh, college repair. Uh, Osteoarticular transplant, autologous plugs, osteochondroallografts, ACI, microfracture, all of which have, uh, the top three at least, have pretty reasonable return to play, but very different uh, rates. So, I mean, the, the top one I did on a player on the Red Bulls, he is now two and a half months out, com completely convinced that the surgery didn't work. <laughs> so, so I can go to him and we image it and it looks fine. I'm like, well, you know, the literature says five to six months. You're two and a half months. You know, your glute is 50% deficit, your quadriceps are 60% deficit, and your saddle leg, oh, guess what? That's a 40% deficit. So we can get 22 MRIs, or you can continue to work on your strength, uh, which, by the way, is objectively measured in order to get back. So it arms you with information as opposed to just saying, well, yes, you know, you need to get stronger. Uh, you have objective numbers to use, which is why that functional movement assessment has been such a big thing for me. Um, uh, we talked about all the fitness parameters. I would say mental health is a big a component too. Uh, we just came out with a paper in, in uh, I believe, J uh, JBJS that correlates return to play in ACL patients with their SF36 score. A little more depressed, less likely to be effective rehabber, probably less motivated, get back a little longer, right? I was pretty, I was surprised when we, when we looked at it that we hadn't done that before. But we all know this in the office that a patient's state of mind directly uh, reflects in our ability to handle the rehab and to be persistent. So, um, 
In terms of the ultimate return to play, manage the player's recovery journey uh, and be aware that the rehab should always consider the treatment strategy employed. Rehabbing a microfracture patient with a fibrocartilage repair is going to be different than an osteoarticular autograph where you have a whole tissue uh, construct right away. Uh, you need objective assessments. I, I do uh, quantitative MRI. We just talked about isokinetic testing, the quality of movement exam, KTs for ACLs, and the movement assessment, again, is an emerging technology that we use. So uh, just a, a, quick, a quick example of what that is, the QMA1, which when they first come in, uh, squat, single leg stance, uh, forward step down, single leg squat, jump in place side to side with a single leg bridge, and then if they can do those, we move on to QMA2. And I'd say most people at their first visit don't get to QMA2. So here's an example of a patient. You can see uh, on the top left, uh, coming down on the operative leg, uh, poor alignment valgus uh, with balance and, and, and primarily a, a hip-based strategy. Uh, and then at 10 months with continued training, less valgus, uh, low knee in a safe position, which would be equivalent to a decreased injury risk. Um, and it goes for both surgical and non-surgical knees, which are addressed at these movement assessments. So uh, if you look at it on average, and we're going to be presenting some of our uh, data at the academy, it's about a, anywhere from six, 6 to 12 weeks, depending on the patient, depending on the type of sport you want to get to. But most of them benefit from the, 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 the messaging that comes with the post-fitness training. So uh, in terms of what's the overall approach that I've been using, uh, there, there needs to be a sequential load after the clearance and achievement of certain functional milestones during the rehab process. Look for your recovery of aerobic and neuromuscular fitness and then return of player confidence and that seems to happen with this return of the other uh, more physical parameters over time. Uh, as I mentioned before, <coughs> excuse me, avoid protracted joint immobilization. Uh, strive for early lower extremity loading if possible. And, and I've really been moving away from bracing, uh, protracted crutch bearing. I mean, basically, I think the body's pretty smart. If you can walk on your knee, you can bend your knee, and it doesn't hurt, it's probably fine, right, in general. Uh, be mindful of the physiology of repair. We talked about that. And again, in terms of the way you talk, just, just be very clear. Medical clearance does not equal readiness to play. And I can't be more, more sanguine about that. And then finally, just use uh, your preoperative criteria to establish your post-op conditions for return to play. So in terms of just sort of general sort of thought comments before I finish up here, I'd say just personally, my experience with these high demand individuals is, is how I treat everybody. I don't treat them any differently. And I think uh, uh, if you engage your patients on a, on, a, on, a, on a level about what they want to do, that's usually one of my first questions after, okay, tell me where it hurts or show me where it hurts is, what is it that you can't do today that you want to do? Because then I get a sense of it. Because no one says, well, I just want to be able to walk the mall or I want to, I want to be able to, to they, 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 they're very specific. And I, you guys are out here in this like uh, super sporty, outdoorsy world. I'm sure, I'm sure the, the messaging you get in the office is very similar. And what I would say to my colleagues in the other specialties is it's not trivial. It is so not trivial. Albert put in like I work. I work out all the time. It's part of it's part of my fiber. It's part of my being. So when you can't do that, I think people get what I, I call it musculoskeletal depression. They can't move. They can't do anything. We live in this north. It's cold. So when you can't walk to the subway or you can't go to the spin class or you can't, it seems silly, right? It's not silly because it's it's a release. We talked about it, right? Release, escapism, exercise. In this era, we are the first generation, right? These baby boomers who were schooled on this notion that exercise equals longevity, exercise equals quality of life. So when you can't do that, and it's been ingrained into your brain, it, it's significant. So it's not trivial to me. I know it's not cancer, but in terms of day-to-day -day operations, I think it's much more germane to the vast majority of the population in and around the United States. So I said this before, and I just want you guys to remember Rehabilitation is not fitness training. Physical therapists are not strength coaches. Unrealistic to expect a physical therapist to get this, these patients ready. And it's really a big gray area, this post rehab, like you know, is it a physical, is it a personal trainer, or what, what's, the, what's the degree, or what am I supposed to do? So uh, as part of this QMA thing that we have at HSS, we also have a cadre of athletic trainers and strength and conditioning coaches who provide in conjunction with the, with the rehab staff sort of training programs and home exercise programs, which we have found to be uh, very helpful. Um, 
I think now uh, I have a better understanding around these parameters, uh, and I realize the more I, the more I know, the less I know. Uh, I respect and value the whole team approach. My athletic trainers, physical therapists, internists, nutritionists, uh, mental health professionals are all people I lean on much more now than I did 20 years ago. And I continue to be motivated and open to new innovations in this area. It really frames how I, how I, I live my life. So go back to the original uh, uh, slide. Why was this important to me? I had no idea at the time, but it's just really been one of the most fascinating and rewarding uh, parts of my day-to-day -day life. Every day is a little bit different, and I'm humbled and, and, and just amazed each and every day I get up that I actually get to be a part of it, <clears throat> and I don't take it for granted. <coughs> a team position is really like a healer. You're, you're, you're allowing people to get back to the things they need to do, they want to do, and it's, it's immensely gratifying to get little pictures. I mean, the Paul George thing is great, but I had, a, I had no idea. I'd operate on three girls from the same lacrosse team, and they went to New Jersey States, and they took a nice picture with their knees out, with the scars. And it was like, it's great, right? Uh, and how does it fit into my career plan? Well, it's really enabled me to affect clinical practice by understanding like what it takes to take someone from injury all the way back. And the team structure is really what I try to emulate for everyday people. Diagnosis, rehab, performance team, strength and conditioning, return to play. It made me realize again each and every day that it takes a, it takes a village. <clears throat> Excuse me. In terms of being academically purposeful, we uh, we really use our registries and, and and the academic platform at HSS to continue to publish in this area, and we'll continue to do that. And all I can say about the uh, uh, the last part is: is it a reasonable pursuit, Dr. Bradford? Yes, it was. Yes, it is. And I'll continue to do it for the next 20 years or so, God willing. Thank you. Thank you, Daddy Riley, for that incredible talk. Um, questions? Everybody? Pretty thorough, comprehensive. But fire away, Dr. Hanna. Cam, what's it like to be the wife of a sports medicine physician? Oh, there we go. There we go. Yeah. Nice, Doug. Good call. Yeah, please. Come on. <laughs> Just being a wife is a privilege to have this guy as my partner. So I will start with that. It is a time commitment for me because I need to think about where he needs to be. Is he coming home? Did I pick the right schedule? Am I in, in the right year? But by and large, it's. I just understand. He needs to be where he needs to be. He needs to take care of his kids outside of his home. And because I'm a pediatrician, I respect that so, and I'm so grateful that he is what he is because I think about every single player. These players are children. They're babies, and they need to be cared for, and I would hope that someone takes their existence, their life, their path, their career, their projected career very seriously. And I'm grateful that he does that. And I remind him every day that if this were your kid, what would you do? How would you hand that off? How would you do that better? And that's what we all need to make sure. We're taking care of each other. And these are, these are someone's kids. Someone's dad, maybe. Someone's brother, sister. Um, so I'm, I cherish my position because I think I'm hopefully helping him do better. So. That's all I have to say. So, Tanya, there is a Garrick lectureship next year, and you can come back. Uh, that, that was just fantastic. Uh, great talk. Thank you. Uh, one question I had, though, uh, the residents will know uh, what I'm talking about, is Albert says he wants to be like Riley, wants to follow in his footsteps. I'm just trying to figure out how he went from unsalted nuts to Swedish fish and gummy bears. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
that's what I used to use to keep my kids calm when they were like five. <laughs> Anybody who has followed uh, Albert in one of his clinics will find somewhere hidden away in a drawer, uh, baby Ruth's Swedish fish, gummy bears, uh, potato chips. <laughs> Maybe that's why I highlighted it, because I'm like a junk food fanatic, and this guy's like, I got my nuts, I can't eat salt. Are you crazy? I can't remember that. Salt? <laughs> yeah, it's we, do, we, do, we do a little salt. Yeah, we do a little salt. I'm all better. Okay, he's back. <laughs> Uh, there's one more person I wanted to thank tonight, and uh, is she still here? Is Pamela Halberg here? Yeah. <clears throat> These usually devolve into a little bit of a love fest, and but it's, it's because we have such wonderful people that we work with, and they make our jobs, uh, they make my job like so ridiculously easier than it should be. And one of those people is Pamela. She, her official title is Administrative Assistant, but she is a jack of all trades. Oh, sorry. <laughs> she, she, is the, she is the face of the department in some ways. Uh, she helps organize so many of these events. And her attention to detail is, is famous, even maybe a little infamous. Uh, she is a perfectionist, and it's just great that we have her and that she's decided to stick around for a while with us. So thank you. So, uh, Teresa, are we uh, done for the evening, or okay, so? You have something else? Yeah, we, just, All right. we have some Go gifts for, for Dr. Riley. So, Riles, we need you to come up here one more time. Huh? Yeah. A couple parting yeah. gifts. Yep. The Garrick Lecture always gets uh, a couple tokens of appreciation for coming. These are <laughs> appropriately wrapped in Washington colors. Uh, yeah, purple is very soothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, a couple, and, then, and a plaque for being our lecturer here that hopefully uh, you display yeah, somewhere yeah. in your yeah. office. Yeah, so. <laughs> so, so uh, Size and then it's the commemorative book from the University of Washington. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you, sir. <laughs> yeah. well, thank you. Thank you. It was great. You so much. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. So, uh, thank you again to Dr. Williams and Dr. Williams. Uh, and, you know, we have lots of events and we will have to figure out a way to get you guys back at some point. Uh, so, with that, I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, I know you're all busy and probably have to get up really early. Uh, so, thank you. Thank you.